This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Human Action Podcast. In this episode, I am going to be giving a methodical, thorough, exhaustive response to the new documentary that outlines the essence and the promise and the wonder of modern monetary theory, or MMT. Before I dive into the specifics, though, let me mention, and it's very apropos for this topic, that the Mises Institute is launching a new campaign where they're going to give away 100,000 copies of Murray Rothbard's classic book, What Has Government Done to Our Money? So if you haven't ever read it, it's a great little book that it's very thorough. It explains how the Federal Reserve works. It explains what's going on with so-called fractional reserve banking when commercial banks, in a sense, create money out of thin air and the very act of granting loans to people. So he goes through all that. Again, it's it's precise, it's comprehensive, but it's also intuitive. So you can understand what he's talking about. Your eyes aren't going to glaze over. And he explains, you know, why is this relevant? Why should you care about this? So it's good stuff. Again, the Mises Institute is going to give out 100,000 copies. So if you want one, you can get it. In fact, if you know other people, you go to the website, it's Mises.org slash money, and you just say how many copies you want shipped to you, and they'll go ahead and send that out to you free of charge, and you hand them out. You got, you know, homeschooling group, you can go ahead and get 10 copies, hand them out to the kids. All right, you know, some coworkers that you think might be interested, this is your way to get the word out. So again, go to Mises.org slash money to figure out how you can get your free copies of Murray Rothbard's classic, What Has Government Done to Our Money? So speaking of that, let's go back to the MMT documentary. So the name of it, it's Finding the Money. And it's, uh, let me just say at the outset, this documentary was very well done. If I were a fan of MMT and I tuned in to watch this thing, I would think, hallelujah, this is a slam dunk. And going along with that, I want to caution people like hard money types or in general conservative slash libertarian, certainly Austrian school fans. I caution you not to dismiss the MMT people and just say, oh yeah, they're idiots. They just want to print money. Money printer go brr. I don't think that's strategically wise. You, you can say that's what they deserve and maybe you're right. But in terms of making sure they do not get a stronger foothold in the minds of the public, I don't think you want to just dismiss them as if they're not worth the time of day. Because, and again, this documentary really exhibits what I'm talking about. It's very well done. It uh, Just to give you an idea, it starts out and it goes through and it lists a montage of presidents warning about the debt. We must begin to make some payments on our enormous national debt if we are to avoid passing on to our children an impossible burden of debt. Deficit spending should not be a feature of our budget. We must bring those deficits down. If we don't, we will leave an unconscionable burden of national debt for our children. We're borrowing trillions of dollars from China. Six presidents have come before you to warn of the damage deficits pose to our nation. We owe it to our children and grandchildren to act now. To make sure we aren't buried under a mountain of debt. And then it also, as, the, as it goes through and it's quoting, the you know, having the MMT people on camera giving their perspective, it intersperses Federal Reserve chairs who are ostensibly confirming what the MMT experts are saying. We issue the U.S. dollar. The federal government can issue more dollars at any time it likes. People like Alan Greenspan or Ben Bernanke have said the same things we're saying. There's nothing to prevent the federal government from creating as much money as it wants and paying it to somebody. We simply use the computer to mark up the uh, size of the account that they have with the Fed. We, we won't run out of money. Okay, so you see the one-two punch there where they do a masterful job of like letting you, know, you the viewer, in on a secret that th there's this, this scam going on. You've been hoodwinked. The people in charge don't want you to know 
that it's easy. We don't have to worry about where are we going to get the money for a Green New Deal or for single payer in health care or to fix our crumbling infrastructure. They, you know, all these right wing budget hawks will get up there and thunder before Congress and the cameras on C-SPAN and whatnot saying, we don't have the money. We're broke. How can we afford this? When they have a printing press ever since governments left the gold standard, there's nothing stopping them from creating as much money as they want. Now, I know your knee-jerk reaction is to say, but that will just make inflation worse. Duh. And you, I think if you're going to grapple with the MMT people, you have to say more than that because they acknowledge over and over again, they say, yeah, 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 we know inflation. And by inflation, they mean rising consumer prices. In the, in the Austrian tradition, we like to emphasize that inflation is a monetary phenomenon and then the rising prices are the symptom. But in conventional speak and according you know the way the average American now thinks of it, inflation means rising prices at the grocery store and for gasoline and whatnot. Okay, so for the rest of this episode, in the interest of brevity, if I say inflation, that's probably what I mean. Okay. So the MMTers will say, yeah, we, we know inflation is a possibility. But what our point is, is to say that's what the issue is. So when Congress is trying to decide, should we fund the Green New Deal? The question is not, can we afford it? Or where are we going to get the money, right? So that's the, re the reason the documentary is called Finding the Money. That's not the issue. The issue is, does the nation have enough real resources to be able to divert into this project? And does that make sense from a social perspective? That's really the issue, the MMT people say. And that's one of the things that this documentary is trying to drive home. So from their point of view, if they say, hey, governments like the United States and the Japanese government and the UK government, they can't run out of their respective currencies because they're monetary sovereigns in the MMT lingo. And then you just say, well, that's just going to cause inflation. What? They're just going to be like, oh, here we go. Here's another person that doesn't even bother to read our stuff or to even listen to three minutes of our argument. So I'm just saying, if you're going to bother grappling with them, I think you need to move beyond that. Because if you do just say what that, you're not going to convince anybody that is giving them a hearing. That I guess that's the way of putting it. So yeah, if you just want to go and high five among your friends, and maybe you do just want to do that, that's fine. If you want to say, yeah, these people are idiots and I want to try to convince them, okay, that's fine. But I am saying, I think from my anecdotal observation, I have seen them gaining a stronger foothold and that uh, other left-wing progressive economists, people like Paul Krugman, for example, are no longer the darlings of the progressive left. That they're past, say, they're old, and partly because they're old white guys, you know, in terms of the way leftists think. So that's another thing that this documentary gets across is their hero, their champion is Stephanie Kelton, who's a woman. And, and you know, she's very articulate. She's funny. She'll, it shows lots of clips of her in front of crowds, getting them laughing. And, you know, and it's not cheat like it's, it's a legit funny, you know, she's not Louis C.K., but it's for an economist getting up and talking about the national debt. She's glib and funny. People naturally think, wait, government deficit, bad. This is a negative thing. Let's stop this right now. And I say, hang on, let's open the other eye. So I want us to suppose that I'm the federal government. If I'm government and I spend $100 into the economy, the government spends 100 into the economy, taxes 90 back out. We record on the government's ledger a budget deficit of 10. Minus 10, government deficit. But we forget that on the other side of the ledger, guess what? When they spend 100 in and they only tax 90 out, somebody gets left with 10. That's your surplus. Their deficit is your surplus. Oh, right, you got your surplus from the government's deficit. And all of a sudden, they start realizing that they've been missing part of the story. That's when I show the sector balance graph to audiences. 
It's the most important chart in the world. Government deficits are almost always seen in a negative light. Nothing but a sea of worrying red ink. That's not how I look at it. Here's what I see. I see what's happening on the other side of the government's ledger. On the other side of the government's deficit is a non-government surplus. Their minus 10 is matched by a plus 10 on somebody else's balance sheet. So my red ink is your black ink. That graph is really the one that when I show it to audiences, it changes everything. So when you see a headline like this one, trillion dollar deficits could be the new normal. This is meant to shock and frighten, but take a breath and read it this way. Watch the word deficit. Don't you feel better? Don't you feel better? Trillion dollar surpluses to the private sector could be the new normal. Oh, all right. I'm down. Okay. And just to give you an idea of the MMT people, part of why their shtick works is that they will lead with accounting tautologies. And if you haven't experienced their perspective before, you might get turned upside down and you might end up saying things that are wrong. And so then when they push it and you realize, oh no, they were right about that, then you start thinking, oh, so maybe they're right about everything. And but they're not. <laughs> okay, but they lead with things that are tautologies, and tautologies are true. That's why they're tautologies. Okay, so um for example, just to give you a specific, I don't know that she does it in the documentary, but in Stephanie Kelton's book entitled The Death Myth. By the way, before I forget, let me plug my own book. So yes, I want you to watch this episode and I'm going to cover some material here and give you news you can use if you want to go into battle with the MMT people. But my book, Understanding Money Mechanics, so we, maybe we can flash that up on the screen, that will, uh, and you can get that for free too. If you go to Mises.org, just type in Robert Murphy, Understanding Money Mechanics, you get the P PDF and EPUB and various HTML. We make it really easy for you to get that thing without having to pay for it. Uh, I have as, a, as one of the chapters in that is my formal response in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, my review of, of Kelton's book. And also in that Understanding Money Mechanics early on, I think it's chapter two, I give a brief history of the gold standard, particularly with a focus on the U.S., and so as, as we'll see later in this episode of the Human Action Podcast, as I'm going through some of this stuff from the documentary, that's one area where they literally don't even touch that. They don't mention it at all. You would not know about a period when gold and silver coins were the official money of the United States government. They don't even mention it in that. And it's understandable why they don't, because it blows up some of their arguments. Okay, so... Anyway, I'm just saying that stuff is all in my book, so I encourage you to go look at that if you want more uh, for, for the stuff I'm going to go through quickly here in this episode. But just to give you an example of what I mean when I say why Kelton is a great person to be leading the MMT camp is she tells a story in her book, The Deficit Myth, of how she was meeting with you know, some finance types, maybe policy wonks. I don't know if it was like congressional staffers or something. I don't remember exactly who the crowd, but people, not just random people picked off the streets. You didn't just like go into a Starbucks and start talking to people. These were people who should have known about the U.S. budget and how it works, things like that. And she started out and said, if you could just wave a magic wand and get rid of the national debt, would you? And these people, you know, most of the people said yes, because they've been brought up in a culture in which the U.S. national debt is construed to be a bad thing, at least other things equal, right? Maybe it's a necessary evil, but it's an evil, right? The way people think about it. Uh-oh, we're passing on this debt to our grandchildren, that kind of stuff, right? So she says that, she establishes that, and then she says to the same people, okay, different question. If you could wave a magic wand and eliminate all of the U.S. Treasury securities that are held by various institutions and households around the world, would you do that? Would you just wave the wand and get rid of all the U.S. Treasuries that are held around the world? And they all 
you know, they're they're puzzled and their brow furrows and such as she's telling the story. And I I don't think she's lying. It's, I would imagine that would be the response. And I don't know whether they say or not, or if they're getting the point. Her point is to eliminate the U.S. national debt is equivalent to making all the treasury securities disappear. That's what it would mean. And so, you see, so the, that's the basic point is that the U.S. government's debt is a corresponding asset to somebody outside the U.S. government, whether it's somebody in the, you know, the U.S. private sector or some foreign government or what have you. Okay. So, and what she said is correct, but then, you know, that leads you to believe, and certainly the MMT people in practice then go on to, and so therefore, let's go ahead and fund a Green New Deal and just issue a bunch of debt and have the Fed monetize it, because why not? It's not like there's only a finite number of dollar bills we can create, and that doesn't follow at all, even though the first point was correct insofar as it went, that yes, the U.S. government's debt is an asset to whatever entity is holding the treasury security. Okay? So that's the kind of thing that's going on here. And I'm saying, it, if, you're the, if you are all sympathetic to the kinds of policy proposals that the typical MMT people favor, then they're making it look like we found a way to fund all this stuff with no pain. Or more accurately and, and more to be fairer to the MMT people, it's they argue that there's a bunch of slack in the economy. There are a bunch of idle resources and that their techniques or proposals or their way of assessing the situation and evaluating a policy proposal will at least understand the, the genuine trade-offs we face and not these phony constraints that are just imposed either deliberately by charlatans or by people who are acting in earnest and they just don't understand because they're still thinking of the government like as a big business or a, a giant household, which does have a genuine budget constraint, like a corporation or a household can't in the long run spend more than its income. But they're saying those rules don't apply to sovereign governments, at least ones that are able to borrow in their own currency and you know that sort of thing. Okay, so that's kind of the framework. Uh, another element, too, besides Kelton being a, a good heroine to lead the MMTers, because also, too, is she gives some of the backstory. And she says she was an, you know, an academic. I don't know if she yet had her PhD or maybe that this was her thesis. I can't remember. But as she tells the story, she was initially skeptical of the MMT claims. And then she went into it thinking they were wrong, and then in the process of trying to refute them, you know, as she tells it, contacting people at the Treasury or at the Federal Reserve and just really getting into the plumbing of when the U.S. government spends money, what actually happens in terms of money moving around from different, you know, the Treasury's general account at the Fed and blah, blah, blah. How does that actually all work in terms of the accounting? And then she slowly came to realize, oh, this guy Warren Mosler is right. And that's a neat part of the story, too, where M Warren Mosler is this James Bond of progressivism where he's a, a, a money guy. He's like a, a bond trader or something. He, he's not from academia. Warren Mosler, that's where MMT, I think, really, in a sense, is born. I was a graduate student at Cambridge University, the first time that I remember hearing Warren Mosler's name. And he's in the, I guess, I think like in the late 70s is when he's doing trades and he, he just comes to see the patterns and understands that, oh yeah, if the treasury is getting ready to float some new bonds, then the Fed has to get, make sure there's enough liquidity in the market and blah, blah, blah. And he just starts seeing patterns and then he comes up with these unorthodox takes like to say huh conventional wisdom says that the government needs to tax the public to get the money to fund government spending but actually no it's the other way around because all the money originates with the government right like where do us dollars come from in our current fiat system 
It's the government creates them out of thin air or out of paper and ink. If you're talking about literally printing hundred dollar bills, that's where they come from. They issue them into existence. It's not like the U.S. government has to go get the hundred dollar bills from somebody else. No, the the U.S. government itself creates them de novo. And so the only way the public can have money that could then possibly be taxed in order to fund government spending is if the government in the past already spent that money without having first taxed it, right? And so he's saying, no, it's not that the public funds the government, it's that the government funds the public. And so he's just started uh, you know, put a, posting these truisms on a post-Keynesian discussion board on, on the internet, and then some of these people like Kelton and Randall Ray and so forth to say, like, what? And first they didn't get it. And then, oh yeah. So I'm just saying this, it's, it's a very compelling story if you think that these people are right. And so if you're at all inclined, if you, if you want them to be right because you like their policy proposals and you really wish the government could do a lot more to help people and to right wrongs and to fix the climate catastrophe and, to you know, re- uh, eliminate or reduce inequality, then this documentary is exactly what you want to see. Okay, okay. So let me now just give you some of the problems with this. Again, this isn't going to be exhaustive, but I do want to give you some meat here uh, to sink your teeth into. So the fundamental problem, as I see it, with the whole MMT approach is that the problem with government spending is that it's redirecting the use of scarce real resources away from the private sector and into the political sector. Right? When the, if the government builds a bridge or they make some bombers or they, trans, they fund... Uh, food stamp payments, what have you, whatever it is, fund research at universities that diverts real resources from what they otherwise would have done into those channels. And so then the, the overall question is, is a general rule, what is a better mechanism for determining how society's scarce resources will be deployed? Is it through the private property profit and loss mechanism of the market economy or is it through top-down orders issued by politicians that are ultimately backed up by guns? And you can say I'm loading the deck there with the way I've described it, but what I just said is true. And as we'll see as we go through this, the MMT people do not shy away from the fact that coercion is a necessary element in their whole scheme. They, they proudly display that and, and hold that up. All right, and I'm not, you'll see, I'm not putting words in their mouths that... No, they're they're quite proud of the well, proud's the right word. They're they're not ashamed of the fact that their entire system rests upon coercion and they just think, well, yeah, that's just how the world is. Okay. So my point is that those are the two rival approaches, which way Western man, of organizing uh society's mechanisms for how resources will be deployed. And I think both theory and history and common sense morality say that the market economy is a much better way of handling the distribution of resources. Okay, so all the stuff about funding and where's the money coming from and budgets and that, 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 that is, I think, not a diversion, but it's missing the essential point. Okay, so related to that, is the fact that it is not an insight from the MMT camp to say, guys, the government's not like a giant household or even a corporation. We can just print money. Now, we're not saying it's a magic wand. We're not saying if we print money, nothing bad could happen. We understand if you print too much, inflation might get out of hand. But we're just saying that's the trade-off, right? So stop thinking of it. And I'm going to say, that's that's not new. Murray Rothbard in Man, Economy, and State, for example, 
knew that. All right, let me, uh, I think I've got it over here. So this is, I'm reading this from, it's a quote from Rothbard in his uh, Man, Economy, and State, 1962. But this quote is in my chapter, in my review of, of Kelton. So Rothbard says, at this time, let us emphasize the important point that government cannot be in any way a fountain of resources. All that it spends, all that it distributes in largesse, it must first acquire in revenue. In other words, it must first extract from the private sector. The great bulk of the revenues of government, the very nub of its power and its essence, is taxation. Another method is inflation, the creation of new money, which we shall discuss further below. And a third method is borrowing from the public. Okay, so it's not that the MMTers are letting the world in on a secret when they say, hey, guys, don't you know if the government wants to fund a program, it, it has more options than simply taxing and borrowing. It can run the printing press. And this opens up a whole new, whole new world. Of, no, it doesn't. We already knew that. Rothbard was matter-of-factly pointing it out in 1962. And the way he further described those three processes, and, and this is standard, like I don't think Rothbard invented this, is to say, yeah, the, what are the three ways the government can fund a project? It can tax the public to come up with the money that way, or it can borrow, which is really just deferred taxation, right? So if you borrow from the public, it doesn't rely on taxation right now, but why are people lending money to the government is because they know the interest and ultimately the principal repayment, if they think they're getting the principal back, depending on the structure of the contract, is going to come from either further borrowing or further taxation, but ultimately it's in the long run taxation in the future, right? So borrowing is not some qualitatively different way of raising revenue than taxation for a government. Be, you know, it's not that down the road they're going to pay back the bondholders by opening up a restaurant that re that's voluntary. No, they're going to, they're relying on taxation in the future to be able to pay off whoever's holding the government bonds at that point. Okay, so you can tax right now, or you can borrow and defer the taxation, but it's still taxation, or you can resort to, the, resort to the printing press, which doesn't rely on explicit taxation now or in the future, but a, a lot of economists would refer to that as a hidden tax, right? So the government is still extracting real resources from the public if it pays for things with the printing press. It's just more subtle about it. It's harder if you're not a trained economist or if you're not trained in economics to know what's going on. All you know is prices are rising more than your income, or if you have other assets denominated in the currency, you know, that their their value is being diluted. If you have a checking account balance, for example, certainly the, the money you're holding in your possession, like in your wallet or your purse, doesn't buy as much as prices rise because the government printed money to pay for whatever, a highway or something, fighter jets. Okay, so there, so the government could keep the money stock the same and explicitly tax the public $100 billion and pay for the fighter jets that way. And then it would be crystal clear, the steel and rubber and electrical components and everything else, jet fuel that goes into the fighter jet program is making the rest of society poorer right? Because the steel and the rubber and the jet fuel isn't available physically for other people to use if it's getting channeled into making these fighter jets. And so in terms of the financing, yeah, whether the government literally takes the hundred billion from the public, but the money supply stays the same. So then it's clear the households don't have as much money as they did before. And that's, and so it makes sense that therefore they're not buying as much as many cars that rely on steel and rubber and so on and glass because those things got physically redirected in the fighter jets. So you could do the accounting that way to make sense. Or the government could just print up $100 billion and pay for the fighter jets that way. And then that makes everybody else, it makes prices in general higher. So even though the households didn't see their tax bill go up, so they still have the same amount of money that they did before. But, oh, gee, now prices are higher. And so they can't buy as much. Their dollars don't go as far in the marketplace as they used to. And so that's the way the government achieves the same outcome, namely that the public has fewer real resources 
on average than they did before. And that has to be the case because, again, just because the government decides to create some fighter jets, it doesn't create those resources out of nowhere. Those resources came from other lines. Okay. So, again, in the standard free market economist way of viewing things, the government can tax, it can borrow, which is just deferred taxation, or it can resort to the printing press, which is a hidden tax. Right? And the MMT people are trying to somehow get us to say, no, 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 they, they don't tax in order to fund things because they can just run the printing press. And so, you know, economically, it, it's, it's not enough to rely on that tautology is what I'm getting at and just the accounting semantics we use. That if the underlying economics of somebody like Murray Rothbard is correct, then to just relabel and describe in different words what's going on, it's not camouflaging or not changing the fundamental fact that no, when the government funds a program that's redirecting real resources away from private sector uses. Okay. So I am going to, for the bulk of the, or I guess maybe like the second half of this episode of the Human Action Podcast, I will go through in some detail with some of these tautologies and, and show you what's wrong with them. But let me right now just mention and, and sort of back up, give receipts for my earlier claims that there's a, a sense in which these tautologies, at least in the hands of many of the MMT proponents, and certainly it's on display in this documentary, they, the, the tautologies are like a Trojan horse. And so especially if, you, if they come in and the person initially thinks they're wrong and then grapples with them and then says, oh, oh no, okay, I guess, yeah, I guess in a sense, treasury securities are an asset held by the private. So, okay, yeah, so maybe we shouldn't call it the national debt. And you get hung up on that stuff and spend all the time there and then say, oh, and by the way, that's why we can have Green New Deal and uh, single-payer health care and, d- 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 and d- those don't follow at all. All right, and so let me just go through. In this documentary, you see that they spend the first hour and change just going through the, the basic points, you know, the accounting truisms. And, and, and they have some clips and, and admittedly, there are some mainstream economists or one guy was like the comptroller and whatnot, where they're tripping over themselves. And we'll get to one in a, in a moment here with Jared Bernstein, where he makes an absolute fool of himself. So they spend a good hour at least in this film, this documentary, just going over the basic accounting, just showing this is the way you could look at the world through an MMT lens. And in that respect, it's not that it's right or wrong. It's just this is a valid way of looking at things. You could use these definitions as way, well, okay. And then as the, as the documentary is you know, getting near the end game, all of a sudden they just start going through this other stuff that does not follow at all. It's complete non sequitur. So for example, they explain how, oh yeah, back in World War II, we didn't use the market process to ration resources. It was top-down government controls. In World War II, they didn't just leave it to the market or the Federal Reserve's one tool of raising interest rates to manage inflation and allocate scarce resources. That would never have worked to prevent real shortages or rising prices. And they also say that, yeah, I mean, why should we let commercial banks and and their ability to create loans and, and make money out of thin air that way, why should we let the commercial bankers steer society's resources? There should be some government oversight, just like back in World War II, where the government had oversight over the loans that commercial banks made. And remember, private banks create money that adds to spending pressure as well. Banks have a special banking license that allows them to issue credit, and that license was given to them by the federal government for a specific public purpose. But over time, we forgot about the public purpose and we just let them loose. Government spending on bricks and mortar to build hospitals is not more inflationary than private spending on bricks and mortar to build casinos. If we're really at full capacity, we have to prioritize how do we use the physical capacity, like we did during World War II. And that means re-regulating the kinds and quality of loans that banks create. They, uh, they have somebody who just kind of matter-of-factly says, oh, I mean, 
these are some of these are free market economists talk about the, the laws of you know natural law and, and, and regulations that you know these are sort of just facts of nature but no we can change the laws we can change the regulations economics originally was called moral philosophy the reason why economics tries to claim that it is a science studying natural laws is because they want to pretend that they're not making moral judgments. These are the laws of the economy and they produce these outcomes, inequality, and we make people believe that that's just nature. Then people will just accept there's nothing you can do about it. If money is natural, who has the money is natural as well. The economy is extremely complex, but it's important to understand that it's a human creation. Guided by rules and laws, we can change those rules and laws. And then, I think more ominously, and this again, this is coming like as the, as the documentary is winding up, just you get one guy, I think it's Randall Ray, just matter-of-factly saying, you know, just because the government doesn't need to tax in order to get money to pay for things, don't get me wrong, we, we should still tax. Like we should just decide how rich is somebody allowed to be and just not allow someone to be richer than that. We don't need the rich people's money. We need to tax the rich people because they're too rich. We don't want an oligarchy. We don't want a world where a smaller and smaller number of people have a larger and larger concentration of the wealth and income. It screws up the functioning of our economy and it screws up the functioning of our democracy. But how much should we tax? It's not that they're not paying their fair share. It's that they're taking more than their fair share, much more than their fair share. So you have to decide. What is too rich? What threatens democracy? And you remove that. And then you leave the rest. And then they have another guy who, you know, the, the documentary has established is like working with disadvantaged groups in the inner city kind of thing. Just a matter of fact, well, yeah, money's a public utility and so it should be regulated as such. I mean, this is not, it's not that people, you know, should private interests should be able to use money to their own ends, that this is something that, you know, should be regulated by the public through the political process. We should not be servants of money. Money is fundamentally a public utility. The true story of money makes it a political decision, a political choice. Okay, so my point here is it's not merely that all those clips we just went through alarm me. And I disagree with what those people are saying and what their proposals are. But I'm saying in terms of the rhetoric and how this documentary works, it spends an inordinate amount of time on the front end just going through accounting, which at times is misleading. And I'm going to get into that in a minute. But it's not demonstrably false. It's like, okay, yeah, if you're going to define terms the way you do it, right, okay. And then once they sort of softened up the viewer... Then it's like, boom, and they just drop all this other stuff as the, as the film's winding up. When these things, even if you agreed with the earlier stuff with the accounting, these latter claims don't follow at all from that stuff. And, you know, the, and these are some pretty serious claims, like to say the government should regulate the loans the commercial bankers make to make sure that the loans are, you know, advancing the public interest. There's a whole heck of a lot you would have to first establish before reaching that conclusion. And it's not just, well, if you think about it, the national debt is kind of like the accounting flip side of private sector uh, assets. And so, like, no, <laughs> even if you buy that, it doesn't follow that therefore politicians should be able to regulate the types of loans that commercial bankers make. That's an entirely separate claim. Okay, so why don't we dive in now? Uh, I'm going to cover three main topics here in this last half of the of this episode. Okay, so the first one is Kelton tackling the the debt orthodoxy, and they say it in the beginning of this documentary, like in sort of the teaser clip, and then she elaborates on it later. I think like in the first third, where she says, 
the conventional orthodox discussion of the national debt gets things exactly backwards. And she says, if anything, what is called the national debt should be called the national savings clock. So we'll go ahead and play that clip. People don't make the connection that the national debt is nothing but all these safe assets. It's just our savings. You could take the national debt clock that scares everyone and just rename it the US dollar savings clock. And I think everybody would have a very different kind of reaction. Okay, so I struggled, folks, just so you know, with trying to put my finger on. There's a lot wrong with what she said, but I, I don't want to get hung, too hung up on it. And so I'm trying to boil it down. So let me just try two separate methods of attack here. So one of them, if you've been listening to this podcast for a while or some of my other stuff, my other podcast, you've heard me say this before, but I think it's pretty important. So it's worth repeating. So again, what's Kelton's point? What's the truth of it insofar as it goes? It's to say, yeah, once we understand what they mean by the terminology, there is a sense in which if the federal government issues treasury securities, you know, bonds, and goes into debt, that the accounting flip side of that is the rest of the world minus the U.S. government, which we could call broadly the private sector, vis-a-vis the U.S. government at least, must have gained a net financial asset. And to make sure you understand what they mean by that word net, so let's say uh, you know GE issues bonds and some people in the private, some households live below their means, they consume less than their income, and they save in the form of buying bonds from GE. So that household, hey, they're living below their means, they're saving. And you say, what, what, what does your savings consist of? And they say, oh, I got these bonds from GE. This is a net financial asset to our household. But it's not those bonds from GE, the way the MMTers are using the terminology, it's not a net financial asset to the private sector as a whole because it's a net asset to the household, but it's a net liability to GE on their books, that outstanding bond shows up as a liability. Like we owe that household, whatever it is, $1,000. Okay. So if you understand that logic in terms of financial assets, the private sector as a whole, they add to zero on net. Uh, And so the only way the private sector as a whole in the aggregate could have net financial assets is if there's some entity that's not in the private sector that's in debt to them. And so that's the MC. Oh, that's the U.S. federal government. That's the treasury. Okay. So there's a few things wrong with that. One thing that's wrong with that is it leads you to believe the only way that the private sector in general can get ahead is if it lends money to the government. And then the government now owes, you know, then deficit spends that back to them and that that's the only way the private sector as a whole can, and that, that's not correct. Robinson Crusoe, stranded on his island all by himself, can live below his means. He can, you know, maybe he can pick 10 coconuts a day. He can choose to only consume nine of them a day. So every day he saves a coconut, he builds up a stockpile of coconuts, and then he spends some days, rather than going and picking more coconuts, he eats his stockpile, and he uses his freed up labor to go gather vines and sticks and to make a net so then he can go fishing. And then he builds up a stockpile of fish and then he eats that while he builds a boat and then he builds a house. And Right, so you can use some of these standard economic concepts like income and saving and capital accumulation and investment and all that stuff even to describe the Robinson Crusoe economy. And so it's not that Robinson Crusoe can't save and he can't accumulate capital goods and he can't get ahead because, oh, shoot, there's no government around here that's going to spend more than it taxes from me in a given accounting period. Darn it. That's dumb, right? And so the analog in the real world economy, yes, in terms of financial assets, it's true. If the household holds bonds issued by GE, 
then those net assets correspond to net liabilities from GE's perspective. And on the whole, they cancel. But still, households can live below their means, provide savings to businesses so they can build factories and dig mines and so forth, uh, pave new roads and whatnot. Okay, so you can see there can be two different economies and one can be more capital intensive and have more savings in real terms than the other one. Even though in an accounting sense, yeah, the net financial assets in both in terms of the private sectors are the same. Still, one group could have a lot higher savings and it's just the form they take. What it is, just to give you an idea, is you want to avoid double counting, right? So if a bunch of households own shares of stock in Google... Google still can own a bunch of, uh, you know, servers and whatnot and have all kinds of programmers who are writing valuable code for them and everything. That can still help. So those assets still exist. It's just you don't want to double count. You don't want to count the physical assets on Google's balance sheet, like the factories and the servers and all that stuff. You don't want to count that those billions of dollars worth of assets once and then also say, oh, and all the households that own shares of stock of Google that collectively add up to blah, blah, blah. You don't want to count those two because that would be double counting, right? Because you as a household, if you own shares of Google, it's because you're a part owner of all of the assets that the corporation Google owns. So that you want to avoid the double counting. So that's why your shares of stock, the way this stuff works, is, is your asset. But then Google, you know, the residual claim that you have, it's, it nets out. You're still, you know, what doesn't fall out of that is the real assets owned by either households or corporations. Okay. So there's that element. Another way of seeing it is okay. Yeah. The, fe the federal government owes $30 trillion. I'm, I'm extracting away from the, the bond, the treasury bonds held by the Fed. The treasury plus Fed combo owes something like $31 trillion to the rest of the world in terms of official treasury debt, okay? And if you want to say, so the rest of the world has this net asset, all right, but what's the point of that? Is that really economically a sensible statement? Should the rest of the world feel good about the fact that the federal government plus Fed owes them collectively $31 trillion? And I don't think so. It may be, well, no, but not, I was going to say maybe foreigners because they can't be taxed, but here's where I'm coming from. If somebody, you, you lend a guy $1,000 in cash and he says, next year, I'll pay you $1,100, 10% interest rate. You say, okay, that seems like a good deal. So you're sitting on this IOU from this guy. That's a, finance, that's a net asset to you. It's a net liability to him. All right. And then a year passes. This, the market value of this thing has risen to $1,100. You go and present it to him to redeem it. And he says, okay. He sticks a gun in your belly and says, give me $1,100 in cash. And you happen to have that much on you for some reason. And you give it to him at gunpoint. And then he says, oh, you know that $1,100 I owed you? There you go. I just extinguished the debt. And so if you knew ahead of time that's how you were going to be paid back, would you view that IOU from that guy as a net asset? Would you view that the same way you would view a bond held that you held from GE, which in order to pay you back, they would have to go sell goods and services to their customers that, you know, they received more revenue for than they had to spend on their cost of production to make those goods and services, right? That's how they come up with the net income to be able to pay the bondholders, right? So there's a qualitative difference there. And then you could say, well, what if the guy, instead of, taking the $1,100 from me at gunpoint, just prints up $1,100 with a laser printer in his basement. Yeah, that would be okay to me. But of course, it's, it's making the community $1,100 poorer because prices are now going to be slightly higher for everybody than they otherwise would have been. So everybody else who has dollar-denominated assets, including cash, is that much poorer. And so if that guy owes the community hundred billion dollars of debt in prints up a hundred billion and passes it around. The community is not a hundred billion dollars richer. Some people might have gained, but that's counterbalanced by other people's losses. In general, him just showering the community with hundred dollar bills does not make the community richer. It just raises prices. 
Okay, so the fact that the Fed plus Treasury owes the rest of planet Earth thirty-one trillion or whatever it is, netting out what the you know the the Treasury debt held by the Fed, that doesn't mean planet Earth minus the Fed plus Treasury in parentheses is thirty-one trillion dollars richer. Another way of seeing it is if all that disappeared, if everyone's treasuries all disappeared, humanity would not all of a sudden be down $31 trillion. It's not as if a bunch of bridges and cars and airplanes disappeared, in which case humanity would be poorer. But no, if just all the treasuries disappeared, that wouldn't matter. It just means the government wouldn't need to tax and or uh, inflate that much. And the government, U.S. government taxing and or inflating does not make humanity as a whole richer. It actually makes them poorer. Okay. So last point, I'll, well, I'll try to motivate this stuff. When, when Kelton says, oh, instead of looking at that national debt clock and, and calling it national debt, why don't we call it the national savings clock? Suppose I weren't an anarcho-capitalist. Right. I think that's actually partly the, the problem with some of this stuff is if you're so against the government with some of these MMT people, you don't move past step one. And you just say, no, no, I don't like the government doing anything because it's illegitimate. But suppose you were okay with it. There's a lot of different ways the U.S. government right now could be $34 trillion or whatever the number is in debt. And so for Kelton, just to matter of factly say, I don't even need to know what they did to get to this point. To say they're in debt $34 trillion is the exact same thing as saying the public has saved $34 trillion. I mean, the only sense in which that's true is the purely useless tr trivia that they owe $34 trillion that they can create, right? But in terms of how should we feel about that, should that reassure us, you would need to know, well, what did they do with, them, with that money to rack up that debt, right? So if... All along the way, the U.S. government had been spending consistently every year more than it took in tax revenue, and then it was floating new bonds to cover the gap. And they were doing it to just throw wild parties. You know, just buying a bunch of pizza and cocaine for Hunter and so forth, going through. And that's what they had to show for it. And so when all is said and done, and they did that year after year after year, and then they racked up $34 trillion in debt. And all they had was a bunch of memories and the friends we made along the way. Okay, that's one thing. That's one way of looking at it. And so then when the government, the public says, okay, so yeah, you owe us this $34 trillion. What are you? How are you going to give it to us? And they say, well, we, we've got a printing press, right? That's one answer. What if instead, though, it was a different kind of government that was run by different people with a different mindset? And yet... For years and years and years on end, they consistently spent more than they took in in tax receipts. But what they did was went out and uh, drilled for oil, you know, looking for natural gas deposits on federal land. Uh, they built a bunch of factories that started manufacturing all kinds of products. And uh, they just did all sorts of things built a, a bunch of bridges and highways and so forth that they could charge tolls on and and they like were profitable that you know the the amount of the money they made on those things was higher than what the interest expense was on the upfront capital costs for making them so they were profitable in and of themselves as individual projects you know given the interest rate and so forth and so what if when all was said and done, when the public, you know, had $34 trillion, okay, okay, in a sense, we've lent you collectively over, over the decades $34 trillion, and you owe that to us. What do you have to show for it? And they were like, oh, we've got a bunch of highways and bridges, and we've got all these factories that are cranking out cars and computers, and we've got, um, you know, all this, these oil, these wells producing oil and natural gas, and we've got this, and we've got all these fisheries, and da 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 and they just start listing all these real assets that are generating net income. And they say, that's what we have to show for it. Okay, so th that doesn't sound plausible to us because we're, we know how, what an awful job the government does at running businesses. But I'm just saying, you know, that's not how Stephanie Kelton thinks. 
<laughs> right? So I'm saying suspend your disbelief for a second. But in terms of the accounting, my point, I'm just trying to get you to see, Kelton just thought it was sufficient to say, oh, they, they owe $34 trillion, But if you think about it, that's like, they owe it to you. So it's your savings. So you should be happy. The bigger that number, or I could put it this way, the way Kelton's talking if, if you think it's good that we, quote, saved $34 trillion, well, then the government could just double that tomorrow. They could just deficit spend another $34 trillion and just, you know, pay some people to dig holes and pay other people to fill them back up. The accounting is still the same. And then, oh, so now look at, we just doubled our savings in a week. This is amazing. But that, that wouldn't mean now we're twice as good in terms, like, that we've... I hope I'm getting my point across. Like if, a, if an individual household doubles its savings, good for them. You know, that other things equal, that's good. That's financially responsible. They're in a better position now. But the way Kelton is defining terms, if the public doubles its savings vis-a-vis -vis the federal government, that by itself means absolutely nothing. In fact, it, it could be make us poor in the, to the extent that the way they're going to pay us back is by taxing us or rate running the printing press. Like, no, 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 thanks. Actually, forget it. We're good. We'll forgive you that debt. Okay. But I'm saying in principle, they could have used the money. They could have used those def that the deficit financing. And, and I, I want to be clear here too, because I imagine some MMT people are going to be outraged and say, yeah, you're right. You crazy Austrians, you hate poor people. Yeah, there's public universities and there's, they are highway programs and the space program and da, 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 da. And we had to fight World War II. And I, so you'd be speaking German if it weren't. And, and no, even the Nazis couldn't have made Americans speak another language, but still, you get the point. So I understand that. But my point is, Kelton, when she was glibly saying it should be considered a national savings clock, she was not listing all of the great things the government did with those years of deficit spending. No, she was saying is a matter of accounting. Just looking at these simple equations of how money flows work. That's how you know it's national savings. And so I'm saying that's a Trojan horse. She, she's, she's relying on the emotional connotation of the word savings, where in some context, yes, that, that's a good thing. That's socially valuable and whatnot, and certainly individually responsible. And then she's, applying it in a context where it doesn't mean that. Okay. Very quickly, there's a part in the documentary too where they list to try to drive home this point that no, actually deficits are a good thing. And if the government were ever foolish enough to run budget surpluses, not only does that make us, not only does that not help us, but actually it can cause a recession. And so they, you know, they go through and talk about that you know, some MMT people saw the writing on the wall when the Clinton administration was running surpluses in the late 90s. And then, oh, and that's, that's why the, the crash happened in 2001. And then you had the, the, uh, the big kahuna later. And then they go through and they list all the depressions with a small d and also the big Great Depression were all preceded by government foolishly running budget surpluses. So it seems like history backs up their accounting. So I don't have time to get into it now, but certainly is an Austrian relying on the theory of the business cycle developed by Mises, I can go through those examples and just show you, no, what happened was there was an unsustainable boom fueled by credit expansion. And then when the banks and or central bank, depending on the time period, chickened out and slammed on the brakes, the unsustainable boom flipped into the inevitable bust. And so that's partly why you see the pattern that when there's an unsustainable boom underway, especially if it's a big one, then tax receipts would go up. Fewer people need government assistance because unemployment's artificially low, blah, blah, blah. Right. So that's when you would see years of, of plenty. It's artificial prosperity. But if it's artificial prosperity, if it's, a, if it's an unsustainable boom, those are precisely the years when the government's finances are going to be better than normal. And in some cases, they're actually were running surpluses. All right. So that's why you do see this pattern of historically government surpluses tend to be associated with a following bust, but it's not because per se government paying down debt leads to 
economic disaster. It's that the, the, the thing that causes the unsustainable boom also tends to cause a period of good government finances. Okay, let's get into the funnest one. Most fun, funnest. This clip from Jared Bernstein. So he is the head of Biden's Council of Economic Advisors. He also, when Obama first came in, Christina Romer and Jared Bernstein had this infamous in some circles document saying how um, the, the so-called Obama stimulus package, what it was going to do with unemployment. And it was, they were saying, we better pass this thing because if left to its devices, the market economy is going to have an unemployment that's going to go way up to, I think like 9%. If we pass the stimulus package, we will keep unemployment from breaching eight. So they went ahead and passed the stimulus and unemployment, I think, got up to like almost 10%, something like that, right? So my little, my specific numbers there might be a little off, but clearly what happened was unemployment with the stimulus package was higher than what they were warning would happen if they didn't pass the stimulus package. And so, you know, many of us uh, right-wing fuddy-duddy economists were saying, what more evidence would you need to show that these Keynesians don't know what they're doing? And of course, they just said, well, there's a distinction between the forecast and the effect that the economy was in worse shape than we realized. It's really good we passed that stimulus because who knows how high unemployment would have been had we not, right? Okay, so that's who Jared Bernstein is. So in the MMT world, you say, well, if the governments can just issue currency, then why do we need to borrow? And to show that the orthodox economists who look down their noses at these, you know, MM Stephanie Kelton's at Stony Brook. You know, that's not an elite Ivy League school. What the heck is this? And so this documentary does a great job of making the mainstream Orthodox economists look like fools. So this is the most famous one. This clip was going viral. Here's Jared Bernstein with posed when posed with a pretty basic question. Like, yeah, the U.S. government slash Fed can just create new dollars, right? There's, you know, it's not like they're on a gold standard. Nothing's tying their hands, right? All right. So then why does the Treasury issue bonds to borrow dollars from the private sector if they have to cover a deficit? Why don't you know, why do they even do that? And let's see what Bernstein has to say. Today, I nominate Jared Bernstein, an old friend who's been with me a long time, a brilliant thinker. White House economic advisor Jared Bernstein joins us now from the White House. Thanks so much. The U.S. government can't go bankrupt because we can print our own money. It obviously begs the question, why exactly are we borrowing in a currency that we print ourselves? I'm waiting for someone to stand up and say, why do we borrow our own currency in the first place? Like you said, they print the dollar. So why, why does the government even borrow? Well, um, the, uh, so the, I mean, again, some of this stuff gets some of the language that the MM, some of the language and concepts are just confusing. I mean, the government definitely prints money and it definitely lends that money, which is why uh, the government definitely prints money and then it lends that money by, uh, by selling bonds. Uh, is that what they do? They, they, um, they yeah, they, they, um, they sell bonds. Yeah, they sell bonds, right? Because they sell bonds and people buy the bonds and lend them the money. Yeah. So, a lot of times, a lot of times, at least to my ear with, with MMT, the, the language and the concepts can be kind of unnecessarily confusing, but there is no question that the government prints money and then it uses that money to, um, uh, 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 so, um, let's see, the, uh, yeah, they, they print money and they use that money uh, to, um, they sell bonds, they borrow, um, yeah, I, I guess I'm just, I don't, I can't really talk, I, I don't, I don't get it. I don't know what they're talking about, like, because it's like, the government clearly prints money, it does it all the time, and it clearly borrows, otherwise we wouldn't be having this debt and deficit conversation, so I don't think there's anything confusing there. Okay, so I mean, that's just flat out hilarious. Um, now, what's interesting, though, what's ironic 
is that, that thing that clip was clip was making the rounds on Twitter. And I would say 95% of the MMT people passing that around and chortling also did not know why the government issues bonds. Okay, so they think the answer is it doesn't need to. I mean, so they might say, oh, it does because people are corrupt and this is the scheme to enrich bankers or something. But, that, but in terms of from the perspective of the general welfare, does it make sense for the government that is in the position of being a monetary sovereign? Should it need to issue bonds denominated in its own currency? And I would say 95% of the MMTers that I saw online said, no, there's no, it wouldn't have to. That's stupid. And no, that doesn't, even in their own worldview, they just, they're not good economists. That's kind of what I'm getting at, right? So Warren Mosler is not a trained economist. And a lot of these other people, the fans of the MMT approach, they're coming at it through accounting tautologies and they don't know standard microeconomics and they don't know standard public finance. Okay. So, and again, here, part of the issue with this point I'm about to make is if you're a Rothbardian anarcho-capitalist, you don't want the government doing anything. And so this is all, no, taxation theft. And da, da, da. <laughs> so I get it. But I'm saying if you were um, someone who thought the government should do something and here, I'll link to an article. Um, where I go through Ludwig von Mises in 1918, right? So he was in World War I and he was from Austria. So he was, you know, he was with the Austro-Hungarian forces. He actually fought in the war. I think he was like in charge of artillery or something. You imagine Ludwig von Mises sitting there doing trigonometry and shooting <laughs> artillery at you. That'd be, that'd be scary. Um, so he's, he's giving testimony or something to the finance board or whatever, talking about paying for the war, the Austro-Hungarian empire. And he explains that there's a sense in which, yes, the present generation, you know, we are paying for the war in the sense that all the material going into the tanks and the shells and of course, all the, all the manpower and whatnot for the war effort that's coming from us who are alive today. And that the way our grandchildren may in a sense, quote, help pay for the war is only because the amount of stuff that we bequeath to them might be lower because, you know, we, we didn't have as many houses and factories and whatnot because some of those real resources and output potential we had to divert into the war economy rather than building civilian goods. Okay. But he says, having said that though, when people talk about how do we quote pay for the war, they mean given those that real resource usage in the present, how do we allocate the burden of that among the different members of society? And there he said, government's fiscal policy does matter. So he said, if, if we were to just try to quote, be fair and just levy an equal tax or even an equal tax, you know, uh, grade graduated by income levels, that would actually be unfair because some people right now have much more liquid capital, right? So, so some two guys of equal net worth, but one of them has a, f a farm and the other one just has a bunch of shares of stock and they both have to, you know, <clears throat> have to pay the same tax bill to the government because they have the same net worth. The guy who owns the shares of stocks, he he can just go ahead and sell off the shares and it's very liquid and you know, maybe he gets a good price for it. Whereas the guy who owns the farm, he has to either sell his farm, which he probably doesn't want to do, and maybe he can't get a good price for it, especially if lots of farmers are in the same spot, or he has to go to the first guy and borrow funds from him with his farm as the collateral and then pay the tax bill that way. And so Mises' point was, if you were to just, if the government said, no, no, no we don't want to borrow, we don't want to defer the cost to the future, let's just be honest and, you know, well, by gosh, we're fighting the war right now, and so we're going to pay for it right now by explicitly levying taxes for the full amount. Mises is saying, you could do that, but then a lot of the people to pay their tax bill would have to go to the credit markets because they wouldn't be able to right now come up with the funds that the government says they owe for their, you know, what's your share of the total cost of the war? So it's true. 
there is a sense in which everybody collectively is, quote, paying for the war today. It's not that they can use a time machine and suck iron ore from the future into the present. But there is a sense in which if the government resorts to borrowing rather than just explicit outright taxation, it can defer the pain down the road and spread it out over time. And so, for example, if the government only taxes 10% of the explicit cost of the war right now and borrows the other 90% and then next year pays down, you know, another 10% chunk and keeps rolling the debt over and does it that way, it can kind of spread the cost over 10 years. All right, I'm not, I'm being loose like if there's interest and whatever, but you get the point. And so there that even if they're doing like a, a similar tax to everybody based on income, if you want, then instead of getting hit with the full bill up front, you're only having to pay 10% of it over time. And so probably you can weather that easier. And Mises also makes a point that the government can typically borrow on better terms than a lot of the individuals in the private sector. So it's still the case that the people with the liquid capital are funding the war effort up front, but there's a difference between are they lending money to the government or are they lending money to individuals who then pay their tax bill? Okay, so that's just kind of the, the idea that Mises is getting at there. So in the MMT framework, it's true. They're going to say, oh, well, you know, Mises was speaking back when they were either on the gold standard or they thought they had to return to, you know, the, all the major belligerents went off gold in World War I. The U.S. not so much, but even there, Wilson prohibited the export of gold bullion. But even though the belligerents went off the gold standard, they still thought they were going to come back to it. So, that, you know, there was a sense in which the governments weren't completely free just to run the printing press. But in modern MMT lingo, even if you thought, oh, th there's no reason to borrow money, the government can just print money. If they think that, you know, if there's a war and they think this is important, they can just print money. But no, because that's still going to raise prices. And so there's still that issue of, do we want to make everybody right now pay the full brunt of this? And there's also the issue too, if you finance the war purely through inflation, then that's going to fall most heavily on the people who have assets denominated in the, in the currency, right? So somebody who's sitting on a bunch of fixed income treasury securities, especially if they don't have, you know, in, if they're not tips, if they're not adjusted for inflation... If the government all of a sudden, you know, there's a major war and they print up a trillion dollars to go fight Putin, that's going to fall on the people who have assets denominated in dollars, whereas the people who are sitting in real estate and Bitcoin and gold, they, they're not going to have to pay as much. So um, that's partly why the government might not want to finance it that way. And so if they borrow... And they only like, so if they just print 10% and they borrow the other 90% and then the next year they print 10% and roll over the debt. And that's, you know, so even if they don't resort to explicit taxation at all and they just use the printing press still in conjunction with bond issuance, they can spread the, the, the burden of the inflation over time. Right, So the same logic that Mises was using, they can use it there. So again, the MMT people don't think taxation is necessary ever, but they still need to acknowledge there's a sense in which the public is still paying for something through higher prices when they're running the printing press. And, and that's true, even if you're an mmt -er and you think there's a lot of slack in the economy, still... To the extent that the government is ever financing expenditures that are higher than the slack point, well, then, yes, it is forcing the private sector to contract. And just, you know, like those excerpts were showing, they do think that on the margin, you know, commercial banks should be uh, rationed and whatnot, that, yeah, there are going to be decisions to be made. So it's not just a free lunch, even in the MMT framework some of the government's finances or the spending is going to come at the expense of private sector output that otherwise would have occurred. And so, again, just on that margin, part of the function of the government issuing bonds is if they want the pain of that inflation to be deferred, that's what you can use bonds for. You know, just like 
in general. You know, you're a household and oh my gosh, you got hit with huge bills. How are you going to pay for it? Would you put it on the credit card? And, you know, you could say, oh, that's irresponsible. But no, in general, borrowing is not always a bad thing, right? It's like if you want to buy a house and you put it, you know, get a mortgage, you know, Dave Ramsey might yell at you, but it's not that it's always wrong to get a mortgage for, you know, for anybody under any circumstances. No, it can make sense. And so why do you do that? It's because if I had to pay cash for my house, I wouldn't be able to get one for 20 years. If I borrow, then we can kind of defer the expense of buying the house over time and it's easier to bear. And so that's true. Even if you're an MMT -er, and I'm saying, I think I saw two people out of a hundred, well, let's say out of 50 on Twitter who were acknowledged MMT people make the point I just made. And they didn't make it as eloquently as I did. I'm going to tell you that right now. All right. And so that's just, again, these people, they're not good economists. They don't know much about public finance. They have a few tautologies and yes, even some people who should know better. By the way, Jared Bernstein does not have a degree in economics. So I'm not being an elitist. I'm not doing a credentialist thing. But I am saying it's not shocking that he doesn't know what the heck he's talking about because he was never trained in this stuff. It's not that he forgot it. He never knew. Okay. Last point here I'll make and I'll wrap up. The MMT people, as displayed in this documentary, they don't understand monetary theory and they don't understand the history of money. They have a few select things they grab from, from you know, the historical record and then they generalize and think that's true for money in general and no, it's not. Okay, so they have um, this one thing that's kind of creepy too, where they're talking about the colonial governments and how, gee, they, they want some guys to pave a road and how can they get them to do that? That, you know, they could try to issue money, this print up paper currency, but why would the people want to use it? They don't know what the heck that, is, that paper is. And so, oh, but what if we tax them? And, and look at the, <laughs> look at this clip. For example, if government can create the money, then why do we have to pay taxes? Let's say a colonial government wants to hire people to build roads. They have a new colonial currency and they offer people so much a day to come work building roads. But the people look to their currency and they say, why would we work hard in order to get your money? Uh, what would we do with that? In fairly short order, they'll be like, oh wait, <laughs> taxes. They impose a tax that is only payable in the colonial currency. We only take this special thing. We only take this money thing. Now, everyone has to obtain that money to pay their tax or go to jail. Do you see how creepy that is? They literally show that people aren't listening to them when they want to pay a road. And then, oh, wait, if we point a gun at them, then they do it. They could just as easily have made a clip saying, and they wanted all these people from Africa to pick cotton. But why would they do that? It's not in their interest to pick all that cotton for these people. Wait, they could pull out whips and that would get them to do it. And that's how the Southern agrarian economy took a, I mean, those would be true statements, but that would be horrifying, right? And they wouldn't talk like that. And yet you can see how matter of factly they're like, oh, isn't this neat? The way the governments, sovereign governments get people to demand their currency is by pointing guns at them and saying, if you don't do this, we're going to throw you in a cage or shoot you. Oh, that's cool. Look at all these good things we can do with that kind of, you know, ring of power. All right. So that's what I'm saying. It, it's not merely an intellectual disagreement I have with these people. Like, it's creepy when you get down to it. And also, too, and I, I debated Warren Mosler and in the comments, you know, in the YouTube comments, and, and then there was a guy even at the debate who stood, and this is, this is one of their favorite rhetorical ploys, is a, Oh, you Austrians, you just don't like taxation. You don't like modern governments and fiat money. We're just describing how the world works. And so, as I pointed out in this episode, they do a lot more than just describe how the world works. No, they give all kinds of policy prescriptions that are complete non sequiturs that do not follow from their ostensibly uh, positive analysis of the situation. Also, they make a lot of mistakes that they don't describe how the world works. They're wrong even in their positive description of it. 
but beyond that too here again i, I could say what i'm I'm just saying that if you want cotton to be picked, you just point guns at people and whips. So what? What? I don't understand. And so the, no, that wouldn't work. There, you're allowed to be to bring in your morality and value judgments when it comes to slavery. And so, yeah, it is true. You got me. The fact that the way FDR got Americans quote to leave gold was through a ten thousand dollar fine and a ten year prison sentence. In 1933, that bothers me. I don't think he should have done that. That was a crime. And that's not me just whining and mixing my politics and value scale in with my economics. That's I'm allowed to talk like that. Okay. Uh, in their description to try to show the universality of the MMT framework and how money is always a creature of the state. And I'm not putting words in them. They have people... With the, with the, I'm looking at the time here. We won't go through and quote it and, and, and do the excerpts, but no, they explicitly come out and say money is a creature of the state and don't believe these free market economists who give this alternate bogus history where money emerged as a commodity through, you know, barter and then gold and so. No, we, we just made all that up. That's not true. Money is a creature of the state, according to them. And they focus on like the colonial period and the paper money that some of the col colonies issued. And then, you know, they've been talking about the moderns that, and they conveniently skip over the whole period when the, you know, the constitution first came in and the commerce clause explicitly forbade the states from making anything other than gold and silver coin legal tender pay, you know, to pay debts. Right. And why did they do that? Well, because the founding fathers had seen firsthand the ravages of paper money. Right, you might have heard the phrase "not worth a continental," right? Because the continental currency got debased during the Revolutionary War. Right, so put it to you this way: Who would you trust with the printing press? Would you trust lawyers to say you guys can create as much money as you want, but just you know don't overdo it. Just do it for for socially useful purposes. No, I wouldn't trust lawyers to do that. Would you Would you trust bankers to do it? Well, some people do. George Selger and Larry White do, but a lot of people don't, right? Rothbardians don't. W would you trust plumbers? Give them a bunch, of, you know, let all the plumbers decide how many $100 bills to create and it goes to them first and they can spend it how they want and just say, but, but don't overdo it because, you know, if you print too many $100 bills, guys, it's going to make the rest of us kind of, no. Oh, I know. How about politicians? Should we give politicians a printing press and just say, now don't overdo it, guys, because inflation get, no, that's nutty. And that's why the founding fathers, after seeing what happened, the colonial governments issuing their own paper bunnies and the continental economy, that's why they said no. And here's something. So go to that Understanding Money Mechanics book that I talked about in the beginning that I wrote. And my chapter two there goes through this stuff. This is something that even I was not fully clear about until I did the research to write that chapter. I think some people believe that, you know, they know the U.S. used to be on gold, and then it got weakened in the 30s, and then Nixon did something in 71 that was like the last nail. But I think maybe some of you might have this idea that the U.S. federal government always issued paper dollars. And then you might say, well, if it's a Federal Reserve note, but I know the Fed wasn't created till 1913, so why don't I? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> it was not until the Civil War, right? So from the founding, you know, the Constitution— up through 1860, the official money of the U.S. government were gold and silver coins. The U.S. dollar, it wasn't that the U.S. dollar was backed up by gold or silver. It's no, it consisted of a defined grains of gold or silver, right? Like a $20 gold double eagle was defined as a certain physical weight of gold. And a silver dollar was defined as a certain amount of grains of silver. Okay? And so that, that's what it was. Now, commercial banks could issue no paper notes that were redeemable in specie. Okay? But I'm, I'm just saying the M&T people, they didn't mention one word about any of that. They just went from, oh, yeah, the colonies with this neat trick of pointing 
rifles at people, got them to accept their paper money. And and then Ray at one point even says that uh, money is always a debt. You know, I'll play the clip just so you don't think I'm lying. And so that's what most people are probably not understanding. They're thinking of physical notes changing hands. I'm talking about the currency notes, okay? A means of exchange. Which I think goes back to the myth of barter. Gold and silver emerged as the most satisfactory medium of exchange. The media of exchange is relatively unimportant. Money has always been the debt of the issuer. Right. No, that's just demonstrably wrong. Like I said, there was a period where the official U.S. government-issued money were gold and silver coins. That wasn't a debt. It's not that the $20 gold piece entitled you to something. It's not even that it was on, you know, the federal government's books is a liability. No, people would bring raw gold and silver to the mint and it would mint them into coins. Maybe that's a way of getting it across too. It's not that the U.S. government decided how many dollars were going to be in circulation. No, they just said anybody who wants to can show up with the right amount of silver or gold, depending on the time period and what, you know, because the, the U.S. eventually uh, demonetized silver. You might have heard of the crime of 73. That's, that's talking about 1873. That's that's talking about. All right. But there was a period where it was gold or silver and then a period where it was just gold. Regular people could just walk up to the U.S. Mint with raw gold or silver and say, turn this into dollars. And they would stamp them into, the, you know, they'd charge a little fee. Okay, so it's not that the U.S. government even picked the quantity of money. No, they just said this is what the definition of a dollar is in terms of silver or gold content. And then people could make as much of as many dollars as they wanted. So no, money is not a debt per se. It's a perversion, I would say, that in certain frameworks, is, you know, influenced by coercive governments, that the money is also serving as a debt instrument. And like right now, the Federal Reserve notes are still classified as liabilities on the Fed's balance sheet, even though if you've got a $20 bill that doesn't entitle you to anything, you say, oh, I can get two tens for that. It's, whereas back under the gold standard days, if you had a Federal Reserve note, you could turn it in for gold. So there it made more sense to say it was a liability of the Fed because it was like a ticket entitling someone to the gold that the Fed had to watch. Whereas now, yes, it's an accounting sense is a liability, but what does that mean? Okay. So he's just wrong. It's not that he's a little off. Oh, if you look at it from his point of view, no, he's just making statements that are false. But again, this under this feeds into the MMT worldview. And so then, yeah, if you think money is a creature of the state, that's why that guy who said, oh, money's a public utility, so we can regulate it. Whereas, no, if you think money emerged spontaneously from the voluntary market, then the state coming in and regulating it is illegitimate, or it's an, it's an incursion into uh, what was a pre-existing nexus. I will, last thing here, I'll link to, I don't have time to get into it now. I don't think it's worthwhile, but there is this, I think he's a sociologist. I think he passed, um, David Graeber, and he has this big book on the history of debt. And he goes, through, I think he's a, he's definitely a socialist. I think he might even be a Marxist. I'm not sure, but very left wing guy. And he goes through and tries to document and say, oh yeah, the standard economist account of the origin of money is completely bonkers. And, uh, and so I have a review of that that I'll, I'll link to in the show notes page here if you want to go look that up to go through and, and I show how, huh, it's kind of funny if you guys are saying your story and it's just a bunch of tribal chiefs or you know the, the, the rulers of some ancient Phoenician empire just using arbitrary units of account for the money, then how come all the merchants are using gold and silver? Like that seems kind of a weird coincidence. Whereas, you know, our story of the origin of money can explain why they would use gold and silver. Whereas according to your story, there's no reason anybody should be using gold and silver. Okay, so uh, I'll link to that to kind of show what's going on there and the the problems with this MMT version of history to try to, to advance what's called the state theory of money. That, you know, it was a wise, powerful state that invented money literally 
And then, you know, last thing I'll say, last, last thing. We have, we, we have a real world example of this. There was a guy who was a trained economist in World War II. I think he was British. He got, and he got captured by the Germans and he's in a POW camp. And the Red Cross periodically would come and give the prisoners care packages and everybody would get some cigarettes. And then in that prison society, the cigarettes became money. And, you know, him as a trained economist, he could really analyze and and see what was going on. And it's a fascinating account. So I'll link that to that as well. It's It's a classic story in the economics literature. This guy, you know, after the war, he wrote this up and submitted it to a journal. But it's great, you know, like when when the care packages come in, they would have chalkboards ex- listing prices for you. Know, you want a tin of, of ham and you want shoelaces and whatever you might want and, and how much tobacco you had. To, what was the price quoted in tobacco? And he said there was when the care packages came in, the tobacco prices of stuff would go up and then it would drop back down. And then, you know, some guards figured out a way to be smuggling in cigarettes or something like that. And and you could see inflation. So anyway, it was a neat little thing. But my point is, it, it wasn't that the cigarettes became the money for those prisoners because the guards would periodically assess a tax in tobacco. And the prisoners were like, oh, no, we have to come up with tobacco to pay the tax. No, it was, for the, it was the process that Carl Menger and even Adam Smith and Wealth of Nations described as the origin of money that... You know, people were making barter transactions, and then one commodity was very useful, and a lot of people wanted it. It was easily divisible. It was durable, blah, blah, blah. And so it got to the point where even if you weren't a smoker, you would tr- the stuff you wanted to sell, you would gladly accept cigarettes for because you knew you'd easily find a buyer, that you would have no trouble unloading those cigarettes. They were very marketable. They were very liquid. Okay, and so that's the story, and that's the explanation for the origin of money that doesn't rely on coercion. All right, well, well, uh, one problem with the state theory might is for society to become sophisticated enough that there could be an organized state, they were probably using money already, right? That, that's, um, you know, it's, it would be hard for humans to be very advanced without having money. So that's just another element. It, and probably, as Menger points out, money is a very, complex abstract thing and the idea that somebody invented money before seeing it first with their own eyes like that is implausible that somebody would just invent money without having first seen it so if you can tell a story the way the austrians do about how money emerged it was the result of human action but not of human design then it would make sense that after the fact governments could say hey let's we wish let's let's move in on this okay so i'll wrap up there in conclusion, I encourage you to go watch this documentary. It's very well done. Um, I understand why the MMT people are running victory laps. Unfortunately for us and those who value prosperity, it's very deceptive that there are a few accounting tautologies that are true but misleading but then those are used as the springboard or the Trojan horse to then usher in all sorts of radical policy proposals that do not at all follow from those accounting tautologies. And so I think it's very important for people to understand the germ of truth in the MMT claims, but the mountain of falsehood. And unfortunately, like I say, this documentary is very well done in terms of just being a documentary. And so uh, I think people... Who, de- who value hard money and uh, human liberty should not just dismiss this as a bunch of idiots that I think you need to start grappling with these people seriously to show the errors in their arguments. Okay, thanks for your attention, folks. See you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.